it's just fascinating to see that 10 years ago, every company was becoming a software company. And now every company is becoming some kind of fintech company. And everyone told us like, like, no, everything here is cash and it's cash only. And I remember we said like, no, we're going to do a bank transfer through the Latam cell or whatever. And they were like, like, no, 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 no. And they like the guys literally sat on top of the potatoes. <laughs> Today on the show, we have Fabian Gomez Gutierrez. Everyone calls him Funcho, CEO and founder of Rubana. Rubana is a one-stop operating platform for restaurants with B2B e-commerce and fintech offerings. It aims to make food in Latin more accessible and currently operates in Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia with more countries to come. Before founding Rubana, Fabio is the expansion leader and early employee of Lapi, Latem's first super app. Funcho received his Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Andes in Colombia. Furbana is a GGV portfolio. Welcome to the show, Funcho. Thanks, Hans. Thanks a lot for, for the invitation today. Very happy to be with you here. Yeah, I'm very proud to have you here as well. You're the first Latem company we have on the next billion show. And for our listeners who have not uh, been to the country of Colombia, what are some of the things that you uniquely Colombian that we should make them be aware of and fully appreciate the mission that you're on at Furbana? Great hands. So uh, I'm going to speak about Colombia, but also a bit about about the region. The, Latam, that we yes. Think, yeah, we think Latam really behaves as a as a whole region. Uh, so so I would say Colombia is like a, uh, Colombia and Latin America in general is a, a middle income so, like zone of the world. Uh, with a lot of people starting to to jump into into tech, a lot of like a lot of the economy is moved by by small and medium businesses, uh, a lot of informality also. So so there's a there's a lot of things to to do. Very nice opportunities to to work in here. Great. In terms of Latam, um, I remember when we first start investing in Latam, um, we're struck by amount of GDP in each country and the rising middle class um, and the relatively high GDP per capita in, in emerging markets. Roughly for the region, it's somewhere between 7,000, 8,000 to $9,000 uh, US uh, per person per year. And when we look at the region, there were on, quote, unquote, only two languages, Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> 1.5, um, I would say. But, but, <laughs> what's that? I would say 1.5 because I don't speak Portuguese, but they understand me and I understand them. So it's 1.5. It's it's less than two. It's 1.5. I, I understand yeah. Carlo. Okay, I'll take 1.5. So it's it's more homogeneous than looking at Southeast Asia, India, Europe, and you have over 600 million people in the region. So it seems like it's a fantastic market to build um, a lot of uh, great tech companies. But if you also look at the number of unicorns so far to date, uh, it's a smaller number versus the other regions. Um, what do you think about that? And do you think it's changing rapidly? Yeah, I, I think it's changing rapidly and, and we're seeing it like in the number of, of companies that are in their, in their initial stage uh, growing. And I think this has a, a, like a couple of reasons uh, to occur. Like the opportunity was here I don't think the internet penetration was here five or ten years ago, as it was in Asia. Yeah. Uh, but but now we have like full internet penetration. People will use Facebook and WhatsApp here all day. Uh, and and then the other big structural reason is there's no capital like flowing into the region. I remember our first fundraising in Rapi. Uh, like like the seed round was. I would say it was like a Simon thing, like he he managed to 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 do it. But yeah. then when we were doing the Series A, I remember we had to sell Latam, and we had yeah. to sell Latam because investors were used to looking at countries. And when you look at Latam countries individually, they're they're fairly small, like except for Brazil, they're fairly small. So so I like I I think what changed is thinking in Latam as a region that has fifty cities with more than 1 million people, like yeah. very, very dense cities, 600 million people in total. 
and have the GDP of China double the GDP of India. So when 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 the market understood that and that there was interpenetration, penetration, it, like everything like started flowing into the region. Yes, that's very true. Um, and you mentioned Simone. Um, you were one of Rappi's first employees, and which is, has become Latem's first super app. What made you decide to join them? You know, what was your experience like the first few years that you were there? Yeah, so so the the short story with with Simon and with Rappi, I like because of things of life. I was in his house the day he was doing his first order. We had a a friend in Como. I was in his house. He was doing the first order. I was like, wow, like like this is pretty amazing. Like I I really like what these guys are doing. And and this was probably June July 2015. Uh, the the courier name was Johnny. I remember the guy. <laughs> I remember the guy perfectly. And I was like so amazed with with him ordering and and this arriving so quickly that I started like bugging Simon like two months afterward. Like, hey, you have to change this. I I experienced this in the app, and you have to change this other thing. You have to change this. And like three four months later, he told me, hey, come and change it yourself. Come and work with us, and right. and let's build a, a huge company. And I told him at that point, I, I was in, in consulting. I told him, I can't do it. Uh, I, I have an sponsorship from McKinsey. I'm probably going to go for, for, uh, for an MBA in the, in the States. Uh, yeah. And he told me, Fancho, let's, let's work in this. Let's make a huge company. And then we bring in all the MBAs, all your friends from, from all the <laughs> consultants, and, and we bring them back to, to continue building a, a great company and and actually like that's what happened so so i i would say that's that was like like an amazing start for for my uh, if i may say like that career in 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 this in this industry so uh yeah and and how were the the first a uh, few months and the first i i was there for for two years and a half i would say it uh, like it was a, a time of unbelievable learnings like i had the like the size of my of of my ambition was was reduced and and that team had an ambition that went from the south of chile to the north of mexico uh, so i i got to understand that that we were like uniquely placed to build companies to 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 like more than companies like to give opportunities and solutions to everyday problems in latam and that it could be done. So, so I would say that that was great. There was like in the day to day, eh, there was a, a lot of things to do because we didn't know a thing. <laughs> what were some of the learnings that you had, uh, or things you did, and the learnings you had at uh, Rappi? Yeah, I would say like my my role at Rappi, eh, like it was basically to like I I set up the the first. 15 or 20 cities and, and expanded to new countries. So that was a bit of the role. But I would say what I learned was like to, to understand how things work in the in the real world eh, and then to start putting like technology for it to scale. So I think that was like one big learning of, of being there. And it's, for example, at the beginning, like literally we had hundreds of people calling restaurants to prepare orders. Like if we had to, we did that because like scale was growing so fast, but then it was like, okay, let's, let's understand this, how it's working today. Let's build a tablet and let's put right. like hundreds and thousands of, or, of tablets and, and deploy it really quickly. So I, I would say is that like understanding like the market, how it works and, and then like putting tech to, to really uh, have scale. Yeah, I'll ask you one more question about Rappi, which is you, you played a key role in building a city launcher team uh, for them, especially during the rapid expansion period across LATEM. What were the, some of the experiences you learned there that helped you to uh, uh, do better in uh, Fubana? Yeah, Hans, I would say that the, the number one learning from that was actually like building team. Also there, like understanding the problem, understanding the skill set that we need for that specific role and then like setting it up and helping people like it's not just bringing the correct person but like putting them in the in the correct scenario so they can really add value quickly because 
Yep. Like in, in this type of companies, like both in Rappi and in Fruvana, I like it was like two years and two years. So and so we had to add a like value, like we needed people to add value really quickly. And the way to do that is to tell them, like to help them to know what to do, but also yep. what not to do. Yep. Like I, I usually when I bring someone into Fruvana or like I, I did it in Rappi too, I did a I, I always do a hundred day plan. Like from mm. from those presidential plans of the of the U.S., like a hundred day plan, and yes. we have like what they're going, like what we want them to do, and also like don't look at these two or three things because we're gonna lose focus. So, right. I would say those were were big learnings. Yeah, and uh, uh, in the founders we back, the ones that are the super best, um, really understand how to make everyone else a lot more effective. Because one person cannot learn everything. Maybe you're Steve Jobs, you're different. But other than that, for the most uh, people elsewhere, you, you got to figure out uh, how to empower your your team to be a lot more effective and decide what battle to take on and what not to, so they can be focused and prioritized accordingly. Um, so take us, walk us through your logic. How did you come to the decision that you would uh, leave Rappi to do your own startup? And just as a context, we, we love founders um, who end up working a fast-paced um, environment learn a lot, contribute a lot, and then decide to do something on their own because then they have they understand what it takes um, to scale. Um, they understand what it takes to go from zero to you know maybe 10. Um, and then again, they found the foundation to eventually go to 100 uh, on their own. So walk us through your logic. So like Frubana, the idea of, of shortening the supply chain of food was in my mind a lot before I, I started Frubana. I, in, in 2012, I wrote my university thesis, uh, and 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 it was actually the name the name of my thesis of my like final project of the university was a uh, frubana, and frubana comes from frutas that means fruits of yep. cachuana that is my my family's farm, uh, yep. so it's 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 shortening that so like that idea of of helping like shortening the supply chain was was in my mind for a. Uh, for a relatively long period of time, it, but I think I needed the the rapid experience to see, like, okay, like we can do, we can move a big part of the GDP with technology. Because like before Rappi, I saw technology as Google, where you move, uh, like Google or Facebook it's or information like around. You, yes. Yeah, you move information around, but now, uh, like, like for for the idea of Frubana to work, we needed to move. Tons and thousands of tons and millions of physical tons, goods. Uh, like physical goods, and this is a, a big chunk of the GDP. So I, with Rappi, I kind of understood that could be done, and and that we could scale things with technology, and sometimes against it when when we're not ready. Uh, uh, so so I would say like that was that was the big learning. I recently, my sister recently looked in my like sent me a screenshot of an email I sent her. When I was only like six months into Rappi, and I paid her ten dollars for every restaurant she visited, like literally to to do surveys of of, of the idea of Rubana. Uh, so like it, I I would say it's it's something that has built up in pieces, and then the moment that really changed everything was a conversation with Andres Bilbao in Sao Paulo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so what happened there? Like, I had this idea in the back of my head. I didn't like imagine it doing it so far. Like, uh, Bilbao, the Bilbao brothers were that spark that helped me yep. start. And that, and that spark was literally a conversation in Avapiano, in Itaim, in Sao Paulo. And I was like, hey, I have this idea. And he was like, okay, why don't you start it? Like, I was like, no. I'm even, like, even though he's the fifth of the Rappi, he encouraged you to start it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a that was a thing. <laughs> Yeah, Ivan was not I, I that happy that. at that time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's but, what we saw in other countries, what is in the U.S. and in in uh, in Asia. Just uh, people very willing, very open to share ideas and resources, and they encourage each other to do something on on their own. The entrepreneurial spirit is the energy that makes the engine of a country's economy and progress and evolution uh, rise. It's extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, another thing you mentioned that, that um, strikes something I can resonate with this is the usage of technology. You mentioned the internet penetration rate, use of using technology to bring efficiency. That wasn't available in that time five years ago, 10 years ago. The user base just was not big enough. 
Now it is very different. Um, how does that play into your thinking that now is the right time for you to do your own thing? Yeah, that that definitely helped it. And there, like I would say, there are two Latams. There's a Latam of very privileged people. Uh, like Latam is a very uh, is a country with with a lot of differences between like social classes. We have we have a big disparity. So I would say maybe in 2015, 2018. Like we had a, a huge rise in the penetration of these privileged people, uh, which I like, like thankfully had my education, had had, yeah. had everything, so I I was part of it, and and that helped a lot, like to start the consumer companies that were focused in the in the top of the pyramid. For example, right. Rappi. For example, like the Ubers, the Rappis, and and the more like fancy the stuff. The DDs, the 99s. Yeah. Yeah. So so that that was great. But no one was doing anything for the for the bottom of the pyramid. So yep. also like the other big change is the democratization of that access. Because if you come to a to a nice part of Latam, like it, it will look like any neighborhood, like probably in the States or in or in Europe or whatever. But when yep. you go, but but the real Latam, like 90%, like the 90% part of Latam, it's not like that. Uh, yep. So so when like in I think in 2017, 2018, that started to happen, the democratization of the access to the internet, to like trust the, this type of platforms, to some banking and payments. Like when that happened, I think Fubana was ready to start. Our people, like the people we work with, uh, is farmers, like small and medium-sized farmers, and also like restaurant owners. And and these restaurants is not the it's the three or four dollar restaurant, a delicious two or three dollar restaurant, uh, but it, it's still a three dollar restaurant. So, uh, like many things have to change. So, so this happened, and I think that change was like in the seventeen eighteen, and that was when I was like personally ready to launch, and also right. the market was getting ready to launch. So I would say a bit of luck, being in the right place, the correct time, uh, and and also like one thing to do it. Yeah, I, I, that's one of my favorite thing, favorite books is uh, um, um, Gawel's um, book on Outlier, and to see the right being the right place at the right time, but also doing the right thing and be prepared for it allows yeah. you to build something <laughs> extremely interesting um, afterwards, especially after ten thousand hours of hard work. I mean, yeah. speaking of ten thousand hours of hard work, I mean, you saw your dad growing mango and lime papaya um, from your early age um, as he scaled his business, deal with growth challenges. How does this shape your thinking? Yeah, so so my father, I, I I learned a lot with my father, like all my life. He had two lives. I would say Monday through Friday, he was a corporate guy, an employee, eh, and then on the weekends, like we were into into agriculture. So it was a great combination of I could go to his, like he was really open. I I spent many Saturdays in his office. Like everyone in his office knew me since I was like eight or ten. Uh, so so I, I I remember his first Acer Aspire, the first computer I I went on Saturdays to play. Oh, like, Ace, that's right. Rapid Rabbit, Acer. something like that. It, yeah. it was like it was, yeah, it was an Acer Aspire three thousand. I remember yeah. that computer perfectly, and it was like like what I could do. He actually had real time tracking of the cars of the of the company at that time. I was like so amazed, and it's something we do in Fruvana now. So there's a, there's learning from both sides. So that side like was was amazing to learn, and then on the other side, on the weekends he was a farmer, and we went like all Saturdays, all Sundays to the farm, and we planted. But then when I when I started to learn a lot, when where the when or or lime orchard started to produce because we produced limes, they were beautiful, and we yeah. got paid like. I don't know, 30, 40 cents of the dollar per kilo, something like that. And then because of Rappi, at that time I was already in Rappi or, or around Rappi. I went to restaurants and they were paying like a dollar per kilo. So they're like the little consultant mine does a waterfall. And it's like, what is happening? So in 24, 48 hours, a, like price goes up 100%. And what we saw, a, like, what I saw and, and I and I like ask people is like everyone spoke of intermediation. Like intermediaries are bad. Like they're like bad people. Uh, that that was what I heard. But like doing the double click, like intermediation is not bad. Like like they add value to the system. That's why they're there. 
The, right. the reason there was intermediaries is that there was no data. Like there's yeah. absolutely no data. My father planted limes because his neighbor had a lime orchard. He said like, hey, it's beautiful. Let's do the same thing, uh, probably. Yeah. And probably the neighbor next, next door does the same thing. So what we understand we had to do was use a data-driven approach to doing the same thing. So basically, this was a push system, farmers planting whatever, sending it to the cities, uh, yeah. and it, it was consumed or not in a perishable product, product that's, that's, that's a problem. What we did different was start an e-commerce. That alone doesn't do any difference. Like it's, it's, a, it's a commodity now. But what does a difference is that we have a lot of data like we know which restaurant of which category, uh, which they ask for what. So now we can forecast seven days. It doesn't right. seem like a lot, but in perishable seven days, it's magic. So yes. when we have seven days of a good forecast, we build tools that go directly to farm and ask for prices and quantities. And I would say like that was the big uh, breakthrough that we could do there. Makes a lot of sense. So you, you mean you had the right uh, uh, training at Rapi, you had the right upbringing, seeing how your dad scale a food business and learning how to use leverage technology to do better. The opinion and penetration rate in LATEM is growing. So there's a consumer base, uh, a lot of more people on it, including the uh, the farmers and the, the, the restaurants you'll be working with. And you have, I think you end up getting the blessing of Simone to do this. Once you have all the right ingre More ingredients, <laughs> More less, that's right. The first conversation is always hard. It gets better over years. Then he's the now first on one was board. hard. The, the, like the second one was hard. The third one was, if you're going, can I invest? Like, yes. should I invest? <laughs> Call me. <laughs> and now he's a board member, yeah. one of them. Um, and so, yet the first product you built. Uh, was an app for farmers, um, which you described um, publicly as a as a total failure. How did it come about that you decided to help farmer first? And what were the lessons you learned from that uh, experience? Yeah, so so we actually did like demand side first, like a little a little Shopify for for restaurants, but yeah. then like procurement was a, a big issue. So when we wanted to do procurement, like by, like at this time, probably two years ago, Frubana was. 100% or 90% fruits and vegetables. So like we really had that big focus only in how to buy from farmers. And we started this Agro Frubana or yeah, like Frubana farmer app. We, we, we launched it like in media and stuff. It was a huge failure. Like the farmer couldn't, like he was not used to, to using it. He right. was, it, it also used a data. And data plans are scarce in Latam, like like you like you have like included WhatsApp and Facebook, but not necessarily uh, like you need to pay more to get like the whole apps, like the internet. Uh, yeah. So basically, it was a big failure. Like like only a couple of tens of farmers used it, and and it really didn't scale. And then I I think like the the big thing was going to farmer, like really spending like time with them and understanding, hey, how do you sell today? How do you do it? And they did like the, the amazing thing was they did everything through WhatsApp. They sent a picture to five people they knew in yep. the wet market and they yep. got a quote and we were like, wow, that's that's really like you, you really need like three points of data, like price, yep. quantity, and then a picture for quality, yes. uh, like like to have an idea of quality. A quality check. Yeah, quality check. Those are the three points of data we need. And it was like, wow, you can do that through WhatsApp. So there was actually a person, Andres Silva, in our team who had joined, just joined as a, as a senior member of, a, of the tech team. And he had his startup before of uh, taxis via WhatsApp. Like he sent like the, it was a WhatsApp bot. And, the, and Andres, like his, his app, basically you send the location and they sent you a taxi there. So like, like we, we learned that from his interview. I was like, okay, now you're going to come in and we're going to do that for, for farmers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it actually worked uh, pretty well. And, and now it has scaled to like, I would say, yeah, look, we get thousands of quotes a day uh, with, with this mechanism and it's seamless for farmers. It was not seamless for us. We had to do a lot of integrations. This was before WhatsApp business. 
So we yeah. literally had like to, I don't know if we should say this live, but to play around with how WhatsApp worked <laughs> and had a little machine typing and sending out messages in what's now WhatsApp business and their APIs and stuff. Like two years ago, like we didn't yeah. know there was or there wasn't, and, and we 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 played with it around. So I don't say uh, improper things here. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you know, to, for, for your um, service to work, you ha you have to have both the restaurants and the farmers uh, um, working together on your platform. Um, as you decide to think through doing this, how did you think through a business model? Do you take the inventory risk? Uh, or not? Do you want to build a B2C business uh, or a C2C business in, in, in the in pure uh, marketplace? How do you, um, but the quality of service may not be uh, as, as good. You have less control on the, the uh, overall user experience. How did you think through uh, what to do and decide uh, you know, on your current business model? Yeah, so I would say, Hans, the first big decision, like we had the big decision on who is our main user, or main, yes. yeah, main user, main customer. And we had a big discussion if it was the restaurant or if it was the, the farm. Yep. Uh, and and it, it had pros and cons. But basically, what we understood is like we have to serve well that middle class restaurant of Latin America to scale. And then when we scale, it will be good for everyone, including us, including farmers. If we yep. think a lot in the farmers on day one, it wouldn't scale because like some dynamics change. So, so that yep. was the decision. And the That's a very was, important decision to make. Yeah, the first it was one. an ultra important Huge. decision. Uh, and and basically, once we knew that, uh, and then why restaurants? Quick one, B two C drop size is very small, like less than ten kilos. Uh, big retailers are uh, are huge, but they had a lot of power, and they hire McKinsey and BCG and stuff to 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 tighten the, the like the screws on the on the on the on the other side and they pay like 60 days out so so it, it, it wasn't an option uh, and then we were like within small stores and and restaurants and we decided to start with with restaurants because it's the one we can add more value to in the short term For maybe in the long term we think in other in other segments but like a restaurant uses like 100 150 skus with a few skus we really solved the big piece of their procurement problem so Yep. That was the first decision, and 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 that's like that changed a lot. Frubana, uh, and there's not a, not a lot of overlap between the restaurants that Rappi works with and the restaurants you're serving. That overlap is not much. That overlap is very slim because delivery is a premium service in Latam. Uh, it's probably for the, for the top, yeah, for the top 10, 20 percent of the population. Of the premium, we are, that's right. Yeah, we're in the in the bottom eighty, so there might be an overlap, but it's it's not huge. Like we, yeah, yeah it's it's not huge. Uh, yeah, so so I would say that's how we chose restaurants. Uh, what was your other question? So I can tell a bit more. Like after we chose that one. Like, how did we do the other Once things? Once you decided to start restaurants, what what was the business model you want to, uh, the operational model you want to uh, serve them? It's going to be a B two C model where you take the inventory of the goods that you're selling to them, or do you choose to do a marketplace model and just facilitate the exchange of goods between the restaurants and the uh, suppliers and the farmers? Yeah. So we decided for a model. Uh, like we have now we have the two models but like the first decision was to uh, to take the inventory and like we build directly like we we build directly the restaurants and we actually like like we take the inventory uh, and I'm I'm quoting here because it's actually like point like in a in a any day at 9 p.m. we would have like 1.3 days of inventory at yes. 6 a.m., we would have like 0 0.3 days of inventory. That's right. It's really, really short. So yeah. basically, like we we do everything order based, but our order it's not our it's not real restaurant orders because lead time is greater. Like lead time from from the farm is greater than a than what what the restaurant knows he has to order. Like he orders the last night, the last minute at 10 p.m. and he wants it the next day, so we need three days. So we base everything on the forecast and the like the forecast is our is our order system. Like basically we yep. look at the forecast and we close in on it. And then a uh, like we have this automated system that puts all the orders, everything comes in and it's like just in time to go out for the for the restaurant. So I would say it's like in theory 
if you look at it, it's it's a system where we take the inventory, yep. but uh, but it's it's actually like one day and very like and everything is based on the forecast that has a very high level of I don't know the correct word in English of uh, confiabilidad. Yeah, of, we hit the yeah. Number. It's source limited. It's only for, for a, a limited uh, number of hours that you you have it on your book, but there's a there's an order there, so you know it's gonna gonna um, uh, uh, you're gonna ship it out uh, very very soon. Um, and in, when you, as you design a system, how much were you thinking of? It's a place for a restaurant to discover new suppliers versus working with existing suppliers. And usually, how many layers of suppliers on your system do you see between the farmers and the actual restaurants? Is it direct or is it a couple layers of middlemen? Yeah, so in in the in the system there was in place, we saw like four or five intermediaries, like like people that talk about the touch of product is like farmer, truck driver, a wholesaler, then like the little retailer, and then probably the distributor. So that's the usual chain. In like when we come in, a uh, it's it's you, like in seventy percent of the goods like we sell in Bogota of the fresh goods, it's only us. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that that changed a lot of the dynamics, but uh, that seventy percent is not a is not a limited number. Like we actually the same product, we buy it in different steps of the of the chain. So uh, the what we can forecast, we buy direct from farm. But then, yep. like when you have a forecast, there's some like you never get the exact number. Yes. In, in some SKUs you're you're above, in some SKUs you're below. So basically what we do there is whatever we're below, we rely on the wet markets with our same software yep. and we buy with a couple of hours of lead time. So so yep. it's a it's a whole system that takes a lot of decisions based on a on a decision tree. And we get to two things that we have to balance, like one or two percent waste on one side, because if you hold inventory, uh, yes. like usually waste goes up. Uh, but then like fulfillment is also at 99. So, yeah. so like, like right now, like we're playing like in the one or 2% range in, in each of the two variables of having yep. less than 2% waste, less than 2% stockouts. Uh, right. And, and that's the ba big balance to be done. Right. I remember when uh, Robin and I went to visit you and your team in Bogota in February, 2019, the scenery is beautiful. You're in the middle of the city, you can see the mountains. We're having a nice lunch. Um, and ask you this question, where's the tech, the real tech place in your business over time? And you mentioned exactly what you said just now. And it just feels like the more data uh, you collect over a, a longer period, the better the algorithm will get. Um, how has that pan out in the last uh, two and a half years from your seat round to now in terms of the tech advantage, the data advantage you're able to accumulate uh, over time? Yeah, and so I think that has been one of the big breakthroughs. Like, like number one, the amount of data we have collected, like we can collect from from restaurants, has increased a lot. Like more restaurants, more 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 SKU. So 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 there's a lot more more data. But like we decided not only to rely in the data, in the transactional data, eh, of of us. So now we have added like two or three buckets like some external, like the weather, like soccer yes. games, like paydays that really have a big effect in, in, in how LATAM spends its money. Like in, in yep. LATAM, if you go the, the 30th of a month to a restaurant is full. If you go the 29th, like no one has money because we all get paid on the 30th. I love paying so, the and yeah. we don't have a big culture of, of saving money. So it's, 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 a, it's a big change there. Like we're not that yeah. German that... I know it's it's equally distributed during the days. No, like like we spend all the money in the first days of the month, and then and then the other day. So like those this type is of why variables. Buy now, pay later works for both consumers and businesses in that. Yeah. <laughs> so so that and then also we have done some some like we have like brought in some sources of data that we're still experimenting, but we see huge correlation with like for example like people counters in some restaurants, like visits to our, like when we see the traffic to our website come up, that also like is, is getting into the, into the forecast. And, and yeah, like we have done a really good job at, like the team has done a really good job in putting in more, more variables, finding which are, are a significant, like have a significant impact in the forecast and then starting like machine learning engines 
that that help us with a better forecast. Like we're actually a lot better than than a year and a half ago, and demand is very volatile right now because of of, of COVID. Uh, so like I would say like once things get a bit more normal, like like that forecast thing, our algorithm is really really going to be a, a lot more accurate. Yeah, you mentioned that the waste is, is only a one or two percent, um, and the stockhouse is also one or two percent. But in existing uh, food supply uh, chain, um, sometimes the waste could be as high as over fifty percent. So now you're helping the entire uh, value chain become a lot more um, efficient. What were some of the stories um, that you can you get from restaurants or from farmers who uh, appreciate uh, or not? Uh, what you're doing uh, for them because you're also cutting out the middleman who's losing jobs. <laughs> yeah. Hans, I would say like a, a good anecdote of like when we think's working, like one of the first employees of, of Rubana was, I called him intern CEO, uh, David Miro, Stanford MBA grad. Uh, he was doing his summer with us. Uh, and basically, I remember the first days uh, we went to the plaza. Like this is a, a Spanish, blue-eyed, blonde guy in the in the in the plaza in Bogota. Like he really stood out. Uh, and and everyone told us like like no, everything here is cash, and it's cash only. And I remember we said like no, we're gonna do a bank transfer through the Latam cell or whatever. And they were like like no 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 no. And they like the guys literally sat on top of the potatoes. And it's like, we're not giving anything until it's here. So fast forward two years later, every like 99% of the payments are, are electronic. Uh, yep. And all farmers and all uh, middlemen in the, in the plaza now trust Rubana to give their goods without getting paid. And we pay like once a week or like once every 10 days. And it's right. like, I, I think that like, that shows how in two years, like the trust that wasn't there in a yep. in a in a system, uh, now now is like now farmers, middlemen, and everyone uh, in in that system trusts us. So so for me, that's that's a big advantage. Yeah, um, and then you mentioned um, COVID um, earlier, and I remember during that period, um, you were very transparent with your board on exactly what you're going through and you involve every one of us in your decision um, making. Yeah, you, yeah, when we look back, uh, you know, over 70% of the restaurants were shut down or reduced their operations during COVID. You still grow your base by um, five, six X and you triple the size of your tech team. We were there, so we know how you end up doing it, <laughs> but it's still amazing to see that happen um, in hindsight, uh, in this totality, how you decide to make these decisions uh, along the way, how has the uh, your interaction with the board helped or not in, in terms of um, giving you the confidence to make those decisions? Yeah, I think you were there, Hans, and you know how 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 we had that conversations. But to share a bit, like I think, like in the in March when when COVID hit Latam, there was a big decision to be done of extending runway. So, so I think that decision we didn't doubt it. Like it, it was a, like it, it was a decision that had to be done. Uh, and we reduce CAC, we reduce a lot of expenses uh, yep. to get a, to have a long runway, so we could think a bit. So, so I think like I had the support of of you and and the other people on the board uh, of of taking that quick decision that that was very very important for the future of the company. But after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, where yeah, I would say a couple of weeks when 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 everything was a bit more clear, we sat down as a team via Zoom now because we we really like the like being in the office. But like we sat and and we thought like we're really building the company of 2025 or 2030. So yes. like if we're thinking of building like if we're building that company like in 2025 or 2030, restaurants yeah. will be there, or we thought like restaurants will be there. Yeah. So it was like we had to take some shorter decisions to like to, to get through a COVID, but not like in, in the structure of the market of food, of restaurants. We really believe that people were going to continue eating two, three times a day in the future. And it made yeah. sense to continue building the same the same business. Yeah. Some, so so like with that in mind, we said 
okay, number one, we have to have runway and we made sure we we had the expenses down so we could survive the the, the cold period, like the that yep. winter. But like let's continue to build tech. And and that really paid off because like you know it well, but I can share it here that like our uni economics really improved through this period. Like we learned a lot about how to acquire and how to grow what a restaurant buys in the platform. So that was also yep. great. And I would also say like before COVID, like one of the biggest change was going from the fruit and vegetable app to the everything store from restaurants. We we actually needed that. Like we needed an order size because order size was dropping so so fast that that we said like, okay, restaurants need other things. They told us like, hey, we don't want to go out. Like we want to buy from you other stuff. And we quickly, like the team quickly got other uh, categories in. And fruit and veg, like the the other categories, like non fruit and vegetable, went probably from ten percent to fifty five percent now. So I think like that was another big change. And I I would say uh, like the support of the board in this period was incredible because as an entrepreneur in a big shock, like yeah, Fruvana is a thirty six month like yeah, Fruvana is a thirty six month old company. And in that point, we were probably 17 months old, like a year and a half. We were we were uh, like half of the life of Rubana. Like this month, half of the life yeah. of Rubana has been COVID. Uh, yes. So like we were at that point and having the support of other people, having your insights of what was happening in, in Asia, having a, like the other board members insight of, of what was happening in other, like was was very precious to take decisions to feel support and to continue to to work in that like building that company of 2025. Yeah. I, I still remember back in 2003 when GGV invested in Alibaba. Um of course hindsight being 2020, more than 95% of the value of Alibaba was built after SARS uh in Asia uh started. Um so what you said about today now being uh, from, from COVID to now is half of the life of Fubana is a, a good, great anecdote. At this point, I also want to give a special shout out to my colleague, Badu, who loves spend time improving operations. And he spent quite a bit of time with you and Andres and others. Always try to figure out how to improve the uh, unit economics. As you work with many investors from m many VCs you work with, uh, they, uh, you have selected them well. What are some of the things that you find interesting Oh, that was good from the VC firms you work with because a lot of founders, I'm sure, ask you as they have multiple offers in a very hot market right now. You see multiple runs getting done in the span of a couple months. How do you choose who do you who you work with? Yes, Hans, I would say there's two or three levels of of how I think. It. Like number one, there's persons like these are VC firms, but it's it's people like it's 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 Hans, it's Sarah, it's uh, Carlo, it's it's Alex, like. It's at the end, like it's people. So like, I, I think like in that bucket of, of the person. Yeah. Also, we think about the, the firm. So like the, the two things are, are very, very important. In terms of the, of the, of the firm that might be like easier to, to share here. What I feel we have taken the decision is firms that number one, have had similar experiences elsewhere. So it's it's very right. valuable here in Latin America. I, I believe like the future is already in the world, just that it's not uniformly distributed. Like yeah. Asia happened first, US happened first. Now like we're we're getting here. So so if we can get like this peak, like this, this insights of what the future looks like, I think that's that's amazingly valuable and that like prevents a lot of mistakes and helps us to get a lot of things right. So so I I would say like that we're in the in a business that like to be honest like needs like we need a lot of capital to uh, to get Latam. Like we we yep. want to be number one player in Latam in this in this category and we're on our way there. So it's it's also important to have firm that can support you in in different stages uh, yep. and and that's it. Both stages. Yep. And then on the people I feel I have like very nice informal relationships with with each of our of our of like formal and informal relationships and i like that i wouldn't like an investor where i feel afraid I, i'm very transparent like i i like yeah. to be transparent i like, like to show numbers yeah I, I spam you with with messages and this is what we're doing this is what we're doing so <laughs> which we so all I, love we love getting them 
I I want uh, that person uh, like to be someone feel I can do that with, and that right. they'll bounce back with, hey, that sounds like a great idea, or no, probably not, or hey, let's think this other thing, or or hey, Fayan, like focus on one thing, like. I, I love that openness on 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 the persons because it that that one is not about the firms. I would say that one is about the people of yeah. a, of really a, like telling you what they think on a personal level, on a professional level, on every level. Yeah, got it. And you also recruit well. One of reason why we decided to co-lead a Series A uh, was the fact that you're able to identify and recruit talent from India. To join you, India doesn't have the GDP per capita a lot of time has, but it is a highly competitive market and lots of innovations going on, and the um, you see scale happening there now. So be able to uh, learn from all markets, not not just U.S., uh, not just one or two countries in, in Asia, but globally, just being very open to uh, try things is extremely extremely impressive about how you learn, how you think, how you evolve. And the best founders we back have always been the one that evolve um, and grow and mature super rapidly in a land that's uh, a market and sector that's uh, that's rising. What prompt you to be this way, and what give you the confidence that you can recruit someone from India to to join you and be effective? Yeah, Han. So number one, as I said before, like I believe the future is already in the world. We just have to like look where we. We can like bring talent, bring investors in, bring opinions, bring conversations. So like Ankush Mittal is this person you're speaking about. He came in Frubana two years ago uh, from India, from from Bangalore, from and yeah. how to identify talent. I think like you have a conversation with with a person and you do fun questions and if you have fun and 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 this person is curious and also does questions back. I think like like you can identify like I can learn from this person. He can learn yeah. from me. There's, yep. there's a match. Uh, and that was yep. the first conversation with Ankush. How to yep. convince him to come to LATAM? I spoke with him over Zoom after poking him in, in LinkedIn. And I yeah. sent him pictures of the beach in the north of Colombia, literally. And I told him, like, hey. <laughs> I told him, Ankush. That like, was a much like, better place to live. You want to at least come out <laughs> and spend a few, some time here. I I sent you, like, I, like, we had a couple of conversations on how to do, how to scale. And then it's like on the personal level, it makes a lot of sense to to come to Latam. It's the region that I I think will have the most like relative growth in the in the next decade or so. Yes. So so it's a region of of doing opportunity. It's a region where people uh, that have experience and this is a, a bit of advertising. If, if anyone wants to join Cubana, uh, yes. like just just shoot me a note. But basically, we learned a lot from him. Like what he agreed on. And what he disagreed, uh, like yeah. we, we learned from both. And yeah. Kush told me, you look too much at numbers uh, to take decisions. <laughs> One of the values in Fruvana is we're numbers people. And, and we literally, yeah. like, like we, we take a, a lot of decisions based on numbers. But but he was like, hey, guys, like you're doing too much analysis. Like, let's do these two or three ideas. And he told me, like, give me the trust to go to Brazil, our most important market, and lead the expansion yeah. there. and then." Nine months afterwards, I can say it was the best, the best decision ever. Now, Sao yeah. Paulo is the largest market of Urbana in the third of the yeah. time uh, that that other cities have have been open. So, so I would say it, it's it's amazing for other founders. I really encourage you to bring diversity of thought. Yes. Uh, like there's other important types of diversity. For me, the yes. most important one. It, or, or, or a very important one is diversity in thoughts and, and ways of doing the same thing. And yep. it, it really did a big change. I think it was also a great experience for Ankush. Now he went back to India to have his beautiful twins and yep. he's starting his company soon. So, so yep. I think that I, I, I lo I'm looking forward to becoming an investor in his company as well. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's still in stealth mode. I'm, a, I'm, I'm giving him a hand with with some stuff, but still in stealth yeah. mode. So, so you're gonna have to to really have a conversation with him soon. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm picking him. I'm waiting for a Zoom meeting with him. Uh, it's it's just so interesting. I mean, this is why what well, we do what we do. This is why we have the uh, Next Billion uh, podcast and now a vlog version as well. It's just the share knowledge on a global basis. Um, I, I know geopolitically everything is tough, but um, uh, when it comes to uh, ideas and innovation, 
it's extremely global. It's it's the free flow of these ideas and talent that makes the life much much more interesting than uh, otherwise. Last question for you is that as you look towards the future of Bana and all the sort of lessons and changes and learnings that you have picked up up to this point, and you did a lot. In a very short period of time, less than three years, thirty-six months is exactly like th、uh, three years. But around that time, you 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 built Vermont to in a very interesting position. What are the opportunities and challenges you think you still need to overcome or take advantage of over the next thirty-six、uh, months? Sure, Hans. So I would say I would tell them、uh, uh, my dreams in the like dreams that we want to make reality in the in the in the next thirty-six months. So like. I would say number one dream that we're focused in is in scale. So, like we're only in two percent of the doors in Latin America. There's around two million restaurants that sell around three hundred billion. They buy like one hundred billion, and we're only so far in in yeah one or two percent of the doors, like in forty thousand restaurants. So, like dream number one that we're on it is expanding that base to plus ten percent of the restaurants in the region. For me, like scale. Like technology allows for scale, and scale does a lot of good things for for other players. So, so that's number one. Then number two, like we're not anymore that fruit and vegetable shop. Now we're that everything store for a restaurant that solves all their issues in procurement. So really understanding which of the products that they buy, they they can like we can be a solution for them. Like many with with brands that come into our platform, now in the marketplace model, now in different models. Other like we're starting、uh, like for some products that have lower levels of differentiation, we're starting to do our own brand Naoli、uh, that we started、uh, recently. And it's having like initial like very good initial traction. So like getting a lot more of that share of what a restaurant needs, solving more SKUs for them, like in 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 the restaurant points of view. And then like we would have a a very a big business in in top line. Probably like relatively good a bit the margins like it like it's a it's a real business that has a real but low margin and then there are two other things that I think that we're gonna do looking forward and that we are doing baby steps in number one of those other two things is、uh, financial services these two million、yep. restaurants are unbanked they like no one lends money to them、yep. like they they receive cash mostly. So like they have a lot of 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 like they need a lot of help in their in their finances. So there's、yeah. a big opportunity of Frubana and its part like and other companies in the ecosystem to go there and help them with that. So we're starting to do some like baby steps with POS systems with like lending to to them when we understand the data, when we understand the sales. So there's a there's a huge opportunity there. And then there's another bucket that is a、uh, software. Like we like there are some opportunities that we think disappear, and other than don't. So we're first focusing in getting a lot of the doors, getting a lot of the penetration. And once we do that, like the other one is like inevitable. It's it's going to happen,、uh, and and it and we're just like starting to do our our trials there. Yeah, I mean one of the most exciting things for for us the leader series、uh, C was、uh, the fact that you. Willing to try、uh, financial services and, and have been thinking about it.、Um, we saw that happen with Square,、uh, Square Capital, obviously in Asia with、uh, M Financials to Alibaba, and it's just fascinating to see that ten years ago every company was becoming a software company, and now every company is becoming some kind of fintech company because the amount of data、um, and knowledge of how the users,、uh, customers, and their needs and And、uh, their lifestyle、um, makes a huge difference、um, in terms of coming up with the right fintech service、uh, for them. That's very data driven and knowledge driven. It is.、Okay. It is.、Well. It is a huge opportunity, and it it will like the most important thing is it will add a lot of value to these two million restaurants. Like it's it's something they they really need,、uh, and、yeah. and no one can give it at, at an adequate price because. They don't have the data. Like we think, we're the best position to having the data to do it、yeah. at a very convenient price for them. Yeah, and whereas、uh, the the opportunity for B two C has been massive over the last ten fifteen years, over the next you know ten fifteen years, B two B commerce, B two B fintech is going to be massive, and especially for the unbanked 
uh, worldwide. The LATEM could be leading it. Buy now, pay later, as David Valles and New Bank I always like to say, was started in Brazil first or LATEM first. Buy now, pay later for businesses, uh, starting with restaurants, you know, could happen in LATEM first as well. So it's just very interesting to see what you're going to be building next. Um, Rubana, we will... Rubana believes the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we'll go to the final section of the uh, of the interview, which is a, the, our quick fire uh, session in which we ask you, you know, three, four questions and you don't have to think too much and just give quick answers. The first one we always like to ask is the uh, who is the entrepreneur and the founder that you admire the most uh, and why? The entrepreneur I admire the most is Simon because he gave the big vision for Latam five years ago. Yeah. If someone asked me, I would say Jack Ma, no matter what happens uh, to him. Uh, the fact that he did what he did inspired not just generation of, of, of founders in one country, but in the entire world. Um, I, I see many traces of Jack Ma uh, in founders and Simone being one of them. Second question is, uh, what is one book that you read recently or ever that you like that you would recommend? 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Great book by the author of, of Sapiens. And it really made me think on the, on like on in this century, like what's going to appear, what's going to dis disappear thanks to technology and how like the social structure of the world is, is going to change when this changes occur. Yeah, great answer. Uh, lastly, what is one habit that you have that has changed uh, your life? going out to the street and like walking the streets with like to visit our restaurants like once like at least once a week like now i'm traveling a lot so so i but i i try not to lose the habit and it's visiting restaurants visiting the streets speaking to like the people in the street is where you learn the most so i try to be disciplined and put that discipline on the team of at least like one field day a week or every two two weeks and it gives you like a real view like a real sense of what's happening on the world like i i hate being a laptop founder yeah and i mean your, your answer are not surprising to me because you both learn extremely quickly you're very curious about many things at the same time you have a strong empathy for the 80 percent uh the bulk of the pyramid you, you have a strong empathy to to help them and that's what we saw in many great founders who end up building amazing businesses. You got to have that empathy and uh, intellectual curiosity. So thank you very much for a very interesting interview. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to turn out amazingly, amazingly well. Thank you, Hans, for the time here. Yep. Thank you.